Welcome to this memorial of when I helped my father build an airplane in the 1960s through the early 1970s. When I was a young boy, my dad built his own airplane. Back then, like today, buying an affordable airplane typically meant getting an overly expensive, older, and oftentimes slower airplane. But dad wanted a new, fast airplane, so he decided to build one himself. The plane he chose was the Thorpe T-18, which is a two-place, all-metal, scratch-built airplane built at home from a set of plans designed in 1963 by John Thorpe. John Thorpe was an American aeronautical engineer who designed several popular small commercial airplanes throughout his life. The T-18 was his 18th airplane design, hence the plane model number. The T-18 was designed to be con easily constructed from sheets of flat uh, aluminum and assembled by riveting the pieces together. It was designed also for a 125 horsepower Lycoming aircraft engine that allowed the plane to cruise at 160 miles an hour. It had a wingspan of nearly 21 feet and was almost 19 feet long. With a 29 gallon fuel tank, it would fly for 3.6 hours and had a range of about 575 miles, which made it an excellent cross-country airplane. There are about 400 still flying today. In researching this plane in March of 2020, there are quite a few flying today in the greater Salt Lake area. My dad's was the first, uh, first T-18 built in Salt Lake. The plane also has a notable world record. It was the first home-built airplane to successfully circumnavigate the world back in 1976. The T-18 was one of the most popular home-built designs of the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s when Vans Aircraft RV Kit Plane Series came onto the market. The airplane I'm currently building is a Vans model RV7A and is a very similar to the T-18 that Dad built. You have to look pretty hard to see the differences. The T-18 was not only super good looking, it was a very high performance plane. Here's someone else's yellow painted T-18 taking off. My dad's plane was initially coated with a yellow primer so it looked very similar to this video. It really brings back some wonderful memories for me because this is almost exactly what I saw and heard while watching my dad take off from the Salt Lake Airport. Dad's interest in flying began when he was a youth and participated in a flying club under Hitler's youth program. This program taught the boys how to build and fly primary gliders. He once told me, you spend a lot of hours building, towing, and hauling the club-built gliders back up the hill for others to fly before getting your few minutes of flight. And that's how Dad learned to fly and developed the love he had for flight all his life. My recollection was that Dad was a pilot in World War II who would fly troop gliders across enemy lines and then fight his way back to fly the next mission but mom does not recall that being the case. The left hand picture shows such a glider that was built for a one-time flight to sneak troops across enemy lines at night undetected. To the right are pictures of planes I distinctly remember dad mentioning that he got to fly at least once during the war. When I was a young boy, dad would take me and uh, we would go visit uh, various small airports in the Salt Lake area to watch airplanes take off and land. We would also kick the tires on airplanes parked on the tarmac, a ritual that can only be appreciated by true airplane aficionados. Dad would explain all the round dials and controls to me inside the cockpit. It all looked so confusing at the time. This is a picture of us when I was just two years old. I still love going to the airport today. One Saturday morning, when I was about eight years old, Dad asked me if I wanted to go test fly a Piper Cub. Of course, I said. It was a nice sunny day, but the temperature was still quite cool, so I wore my favorite silver leather flight jacket. It had several stars and aircraft insignia, and I looked very much like a pro-military pilot. When we got to the airport, we met the owner of the yellow two-seater J3 Cub that looked just like the pictures you see here. Dad did a good look over, and then he and the owner decided to go fly. I was instructed to stay in our locked car, so I watched them do several touch and goes after which they flew off into the horizon. When they got back, um, I was asked if uh, 
I would be willing if I wanted if I was interested in, in taking a ride in the airplane and of course yes was my answer so the owner took me up in his cub and we went around the pattern a couple times this was my first flight in an airplane and it was magical after years of looking up at airplanes flying by I finally got to go aloft and see smell and feel what it was like to fly as I gazed all about me, my eyes were wide open and I finally understood why my dad was so nuts about airplanes and then from then on I was hooked too. Dad joined the EAA which stood for the Experimental Aircraft Association. This was an organization that promoted aviation and building your own airplanes at home. Salt Lake City had their own EAA chapter and Dad began attending their monthly meetings. He had only attended a few times when he came home late one Friday evening after one of their meetings carrying a big brown flight leather briefcase that contained a special surprise. He couldn't wait to tell me all about it, so he got me out of bed around 11 p.m. at night and had me follow him into the dining room. Once seated, he shared with me that he had bought plans to build an all-metal two-seater airplane called a Thorpe T-18. Dad could hardly contain his enthusiasm as he pulled out some blueprints from the leather briefcase and laid them out onto the dining room table. I was in total awe as I had never seen blueprints before. He also had a magazine article about the plane by John Thorpe, so I could see the pictures of the finished plane and then look upon the overview plan sheet showing the plane from the top, side, and front. It was all pretty exciting to me. Dad proceeded to pull out one blueprint after another after another, explaining what each one was for, and pretty soon the dining room table was covered several layers deep, so we started spreading them out on the dining room floor. He kept on pulling one blueprint out after another until we had the entire dining room and living room floor covered with blueprints. These blueprints would have quite an impact in my life. I fell in love with the ingenuity and beauty of the designs they conveyed, and it would eventually lead me to college where I received a degree in design drafting and had a great career in designing and later selling and marketing radiation detection and monitoring equipment. I believe Dad started building the airplane in 1964 when I was around nine years old and it took about seven years to build. He began by staying after his work shift and machining aluminum parts using machining equipment available there and would bring them home once completed and show me. I got to see the finished part and match them up to the blueprints. These were great lessons for me. We also built a very large and sturdy work table that took over our one car garage, so our car stayed outside. After we received a large shipment of aluminum sheets, Dad laid the metal sheets on the table and would begin drawing parts to full scale off the blueprints. The first parts were ring ribs. After cutting out all of the ribs, he built a wood buck that was used to bend the wing rib edges using a rubber hammer. Dad taught me how to do this and I got to do a pretty good number of them. Then came the wing spar and riveting. I had no idea what I was in for. There were literally thousands and thousands of rivets that had to be bucked. Once a hole was drilled through the pieces of metal to be attached together, you you placed a small rivet through the two pieces of metal and then you um, place an air hammer called a rivet gun on top of the head and a heavy metal bucking bar on the back side of the rivet. The gun trigger was then pressed, causing the air hammer to ram the rivet many times in a short burst while the bucking bar smashed the back side of the rivet until its diameter was far greater than the original hole. The trick was to get the rivet smashed just right. It was a team effort and it took a lot of skill for the bucker that was me, to buck straight and true and not let it go all over the place. I got really good at it and would all also learn how to use a rivet gun later on in the project. Meanwhile, Dad started taking me to the EAA chapter meetings. My favorite ones were when we would go and visit other projects. There were all kinds of planes and different building materials and I loved every minute of it. I just learned so much from all of this. Building with my dad and seeing others' projects really instilled in me a burning desire to build my own airplane. So I did a few plastic models, but then quickly graduated to flying and building gas-powered U-control airplanes. U-control is where you have two movable strings attached to the airplane so you can control the up and down movement while it flew in circles around you. 
From just that one control, you could do some really amazing aerobatics or crash, which is what I did a lot of. Here's an example of you controlled airplanes like the ones that I used to fly. So here it goes. So you can see the pilot in the center there. And he just has the two control lines. There it's going upside down and doing an outside loop. Pretty scary because you're having to reverse all the controls. Remember that up is really down and down is really up. Now he's back flying normal. And here he's doing a figure eight. Another airplane. And here you get a good chance to look at the pilot in the center of the circle and see the control horn that he had in his hand. And that's how you control the airplane. I always needed help launching my planes, so I would get my friends to come help. They soon started building and flying their own airplanes, and before you knew it, we had quite a flying club in our neighborhood. Dad became the chapter secretary and was responsible for getting out the monthly postcards to remind everyone about the upcoming meeting. The postcards would have pictures of members' projects, and we were the subject of those many times. Through this building process, Dad and I became very close as a father and son, and I usually looked forward to helping him on his project. He was also a great teacher to me. By observing him, I learned I could pretty much do and accomplish anything I put my mind to. It was an invaluable lesson that served me very well throughout my life. The T-18 was a scratch build type plane. There were no kit, there was no kit, I should say, for any part of it, as is so common today. There were also no online mail order stores like we have today, so you had to mostly scrounge for parts or make them yourself. As a result, we obtained a lot of parts from crashed airplanes and also from a military surplus store outside of Ogden, not too far from Hill Air Force Base. They carried used items as well as new aircraft grade rivets, bolts, nuts, and washers, etc. And I loved going there because they had old fighter jet cockpit carcasses sitting outside and I'd be able to go inside of them and, um, and play around. Sitting in the pilot's position and with the canopy closed, I imagined all the places it had been, the brave pilots who flew them at mock speed, and all the battles that they experienced. Once all the big parts of the airplane were done, we finally got to the point of taking it to the airport to complete it. The single car garage and adjoining makeshift porch workshop was still too small to hook up the full set of wings. So Dad designed and built a very custom trailer hitch that bolted to the inside of the trunk of our 1966 Mustang that perfectly attached to the tail wheel of the airplane fuselage. This left the two main landing gear wheels to trail behind. And with that, we got up very early one Saturday morning before there was much traffic and trailered the plane to the airport. I followed closely behind in my red 1968 VW and all went smoothly as planned. The excitement really became elevated now that the plane was at the airport because we could see the end to building coming soon. About this time, Dad started taking flight lessons so he could get his private pilot's license. He studied for quite a long spell and was very happy to finally pass his examination and receive his ticket on January 31st, 1971. One of the more anxious moments came when it was time to fire up the engine for the first time at the airport. Dad had purchased an O290G, uh, excuse me, O290GP engine called for in the original plans and it had to be overhauled. As luck would have it, one of my parents' Germans friends just happened to be married to an American aircraft mechanic named Lee, who worked at the same airport we had our airplane at, so Dad arranged to have him overhaul it for us. After installing the engine and making all the connections, the big moment came when it was time to fuel up the plane, kick the tires, and light the fires. All went well and according to plan except for lighting the fires. Crank, crank, and crank, but nothing to show for it except for a dead starter battery. So after a few tweaks and hope gleaming from my dad's eyes, he decided he could, we could hand crank the airplane to get it started. As a measure of precaution, he tied the tail wheel to the telephone pole at the outside corner of our hangar, and then dad showed me how the proper way on how to hand prop the plane to get it started. Hey, wait, was I getting the dangerous part of this deal? 
why was that why was I getting that part well that explained that he needed to be inside the plane to make sure all the proper settings and necessary adjustments were in order so it did not flood and also to bring it under control once it got started all I had to do was swing the prop easy peasy well that was may have been all logical except for one very very big thing you see at the last EAA chapter meeting just a few weeks prior we watched a training movie produced by the FAA or the Federal Aviation Agency it just so happened that one of their employees was filming at an airport when a guy tried taking his girlfriend on her first airplane ride unfortunately the airplane would not start and the battery went dead sound familiar well he showed her how to run the controls inside the cockpit and he went out and hand propped the airplane after a few attempts the engine came to life and when I say life I mean full life and the girl inside freaked out obviously forgot everything she had been shown and must have just frozen the planes right brake was stuck so the airplane began spinning in circles the boyfriend narrowly escaped being shredded to pieces by the spinning propeller at startup and darted for the cockpit when the plane began spinning he found momentary refuge by hanging on to one of the wing struts but the centrifugal force exceeded his strength and he became victim to the impending disaster and even getting run over by the tailwheel. The plane finally stopped when it, was, when it plowed into two other planes. He survived, albeit cut and beat up pretty badly. His girlfriend also went to the hospital very traumatized. Needless to say, this left an indelible imprint in my mind and I remember having nightmares all night over this. So here I am, standing in front of this meat cutter blade they call an airplane propeller, with the images still vividly replaying in my mind as my dad tried to assure me that this was a piece of cake. Sure, Dad, what could possibly go wrong? Well, tell the truth, I was pretty horrified. So, being the dutiful son, I flipped the prop and then would turn and run like the blazes for about 25 feet. When it didn't start, I would repeat until after a few dozen tries, I got braver and braver and stopped running away. But at last, it never started that day. After a lengthy investigation, the mechanic came back and realized the timing chain was not in the right place. So they had to tear into the engine one more time and correct it. By then, about a week later, the battery was recharged and it started up easily under its own power. Phew, I was never so glad. In preparation for flying a tailwheel style airplane like the T-18, Dad spent some time flying with Pat Patterson, the same guy who sold him his T-18 plans. Pat was an aircraft controller at Hill Air Force Base and one of the regular EAA members. He owned and flew an old tail dragger airplane called a Stinson, like the one you see here. Dad didn't like flying it. He said it had landing gear was very spongy-like and was terrible to land and, spe and steer but it was supposed to help him to better be to be better prepared for flying his tail dragger T-18. After the FAA made its final inspection, Dad was cleared to go and fly his airplane. Then, just a few days later, on February 10th, 1971, I came home from school as I normally did in the afternoon and was very surprised to see my dad was already home. It was then I learned he had taken off work and gone and did his first test flight on the airplane. He told me it flew wonderfully and was nothing at all like Stins the Stinson, which pleased him enormously. Dad was beaming and he couldn't wait for his next flight. Dad's logbook shows that his first flight consisted of three takeoff and landings that lasted about 20 minutes. No problems were discovered either in the flight or the post inspection, so he felt confident in leaving the pattern on his next flight which he did three days later with a flight lasting two hours and 21 minutes. Since the plane was licensed as experimental, he was required to fly off 75 hours before taking up a passenger. So I had to be patient while he proved the airplane's soundness while also becoming more familiar with its flight characteristics. He accrued 27 flights in 1971. He did not fly the plane much that September. I believe that was when he painted the plane it came out real nice with its white and blue colors. Then flights resumed with many flights from October through December. In 1972, he flew seven times in January. 
Bad weather and bad communications radio prevented him from flying uh, throughout February. The faulty radio oftentimes uh, failed to communicate with the tower, so he finally went and bought a brand new radio and installed it. The total cost of the airplane up to that point was only $1,500. The radio added another $1,000 to the tally. His last logbook flight entry was January 23, 1972. Then, on that fateful Sunday, March 5th, the weather cleared up after a prolonged period of bad weather. So Dad and a lot of other pilots took advantage and went flying. He flew up to Ogden, got a snack, and then attempted to refuel, but the gas waiting line was very long. So he decided he had enough gas for the short trip back to Salt Lake and left without refueling. Apparently Dad had promised Mom to be back home by a certain time and not wanting to disappoint her took off. What he had not planned on was running into heavy traffic back in Salt Lake. The landing pattern at Salt Lake International was exceptionally full since many other pilots were also taking advantage of the beautiful weather. The tower therefore had him extend his south downward leg for a very long time when the engine ran out of gas and sputtered to a halt. Had Dad been able to land promptly upon his arrival in a normal fashion, he would most likely have made it and back, uh, made it back to the airport safely. Nevertheless, he broke the law by not having enough gas reserves and it would cost him his life. When his engine stopped, he notified the Salt Lake International Tower of his situation. The tower advised him to land at the Salt Lake Airport number 2 near Granger since it was closer to his position. He replied he didn't think he would make it. That was at 4.06 p.m. As the news reported later that evening, eyewitnesses saw the airplane stall just across the street from the runway at airport number two. He crashed into a rock gravel pit located in an open field at 4500 south and 2400 west. Calls to the sheriff's station reporting the crash occurred at 4.08 p.m. The aeronautical section map shows rough estimates of flight times and distances from Ogden to each airport. The added distance to the Salt Lake No. 2 airport, combined with the need to climb another 300 or more feet in elevation to reach that airport, cost him his life. If he had had another 10 seconds of gas, he would have successfully landed at airport No. 2. In other words, if he would have had just another 50 cc's of gas, an amount you could easily cup in your hand, he would have made it and lived. That few seconds shortage killed Dad and changed our world forever. An old news clipping, now greatly faded by time, shows just how severe the damage to the airplane was. Eyewitnesses described the plane gliding toward the runway but then stalling and falling out of the sky. Dad was killed on impact. I saw Dad as he left for the airport that morning. I was across the street visiting with my neighbor friend, Kevin Earl, who was outside mowing the lawn. Kevin was dating a young girl at the time named Suzanne Cope, who as you all know later became my wife. I watched Dad pull out of the driveway and then look over his shoulder in my direction to check for traffic. I waved goodbye, but he never saw me. I recall feeling sad he had not seen my farewell gesture, but I knew I would see him later. I also remember a very strange and unfamiliar feeling about his departure, but being young I dismissed it and went about my day. Early that afternoon, I went to work at the Little America restaurant located on Main Street near downtown Salt Lake. I worked there as a busboy, busing dishes and cleaning tables. While going about my normal routine, a police officer came back into the back area kitchen area where I was unloading a tub of dirty dishes. He went to my manager's office, which was a wall by large windows, and after a very brief visit, my boss came and got me and, and took me to the officer. I was told that my father was in the University of Utah Hospital and to follow the officer up there in my car. He would not tell me any more. I was halfway to the hospital when I recalled Dad had gone flying. I tried to imagine all the scenarios that could have gone wrong short of crashing. But when I got to the hospital and went through the sliding doors in the emergency entrance, there was Mom and Angela waiting for my arrival. As our eyes met one another, I knew in an instant that my dad was dead. They didn't need to say anything. The shock and searing pain was immense, and the days that followed are a blur, dotted with calls of support and sympathy, a visit to the funeral parlor to select a casket and make funeral arrangements, 
a visit from our Lutheran priest, and much more. Then, four days later, on Thursday, March the 9th, just one day before my dad's 46th birthday, we held a ceremony at our Lutheran church and then buried him at the Salt Lake City Cemetery. In attendance were our very closest friends. On the right from the church services to the cemetery in the hearse, I saw my high school swim coach, Jay Kurt, downtown walking on the sidewalk. He saw me too, and so we waved to each other. He had a very sad look about him. Coach was very good to me and acted as a surrogate father of sorts thereafter. I loved him for that and appreciated all he did for me throughout my early life. His, only, his own life would be uh, cut short several years later due to cancer. Several friends from the EAA chapter picked up the wreckage and took it to the airport and stored it in one of the empty hangars. They let me know about it so I could scavenge parts off it before discarding the rest. So a week or two later, I went to visit the wreckage. It was bad, and there were traces of Dad's blood on the panel and down where his feet had been. So scavenging parts was not an easy task. The wreck was so bad, there really weren't too many salvageable parts anyway. As I recall, I only got a few parts and then donated them to the EAA chapter. I borrowed a truck and hauled it off to a scrapyard where I think I only got about $30. Seven long years of work, $2,500 of hard-earned savings, and all that was left was a few dollars I handed over to Mom. Over the course of the next couple of years, Pat Patterson, who had sold him the T-18 plans along with his wife and another couple, crashed in their four-seater Stinson into a train rail car, killing all four aboard. The nice gentleman, who was a very good friend and had lent me his hangar and trailer to store the wrecked plane, would also be killed within a year in his Cessna 195 on final approach to Salt Lake Airport in bad weather. I was convinced by this time man was not meant to fly, and I walked away from what had become a great love of mine, and it took many years for that love for aviation to resurface. I have contemplated all that was gained and all that was lost in this chapter of my life. My dad was not only a father to me, but was truly my very best friend. Dad was also a great teacher. I learned a lot about machinery, how things were made, how to read blueprints, how to form and shape metal, how to rivet, and much, much more about planes and aviation and other things. But more importantly, he taught me how to work hard, how to figure things out for myself, and how I could conquer and accomplish anything I set my mind to. We had shared dreams of flying all over this great country of ours and instilled in me a great desire to earn my own pilot license, which I finally did 26, year, 26 years later in 1998. He had been a surveyor when he was first married. I too would end up working part-time for two years as a surveyor while going through college. He had built his own first home. I would do likewise. I learned how we too often take mortality for granted and how things can change in an instant. I learned that the world moves on as if nothing ever changes or changed despite my world having been utterly dashed to pieces by the death of a loved one. I learned that life can be cruel at times and you can either be beaten by it or stand back up, brush yourself off and move forward again. I learned that our spirits continue after mortality ends and that we can be together as families. I learned that God exists and that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and that there is a plan for all of us. I learned how precious our life here is on earth and not to waste it because we never know when we will be taken. Would I have traded all that I learned from his passing for a longer time with my dad here on earth? Naturally, the answer is yes. But through Dad's passing, I learned invaluable insights into life that I might not have learned had he lived on. In a way, he gave me an invaluable existential gift that helped shape me even more. My dad was the greatest dad a son could ever have wanted. He inspired me, he shaped me into who I've become today, and instilled in me the constant desire to press forward towards ever-expanding horizons. Following in his footsteps, I've tasted what it is like to build a flying machine, breathe life into it, master its powers, and then go aloft into the wondrous skies above and peer down upon the majestic beauty of the earth below. Dad's relationship with me set the pattern for how I tried to be with my own boys. I don't believe I succeeded in being as good as he was, but I see my sons and daughters who are becoming incredible parents with very special relationships with their children 
and I'm very, very proud of them. My dad was my hero on many levels, and I credit him with many of the accomplishments in my life. In conclusion, I genuinely hope that angels don't have wings in heaven, because when I see my dad again, I want to go with him to the local airport, kick some tires, light the fires, and fly side by side into the new horizons that await us there. I love and miss you, Dad, and I look forward to our future together and the lessons you have to share with me there. Thank you for watching.